Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others, and the planet. Welcome to Episode 73 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. It is such a pleasure to have Mr. Ron Moore back on the show with us today. Ron joined us last week in Episode 72, where he spoke about operational reliability and performance. We chatted about how leaders need to look at their business as a whole system rather than silos. If you haven't already, I encourage you to listen to episode 72 to get the background of this chat. Today, we chat about engaging your team to align the whole organization and jump on the bandwagon together. Let's get into the episode. Ron, I'd be keen to talk a bit on the engagement bit because I could see that we, we get leadership and the leadership are right. Okay, we, I need to get our organization thinking systemically rather than in silos <coughs> and, you know, and fighting against each other. I need to understand operational performance reliability. Okay, yep. I understand now I need to align strategically, but I also need to align them cross-functionally as a system. Yep. But then, okay, how do I engage in the right way that I don't destroy this whole thing with the initial rollout or the initial phase that I go about it? How do I make sure that I help people engage and actually own it and come along on the journey with me? Well, you know, the first thought that popped in my mind was you start small, <laughs> you know, you take small bites and you keep chewing, you know, uh, but let me back it up just a bit. Let me give you some statistics, you know, people that study this sort of thing, uh, Bob Kelleher in particular, uh, they tell me that in a typical organization about what 30% of the workforce is engaged. You know, and the, the numbers vary a bit from organization to organization, but, you know, typically you'll see about 30% of the organization, the employees are truly engaged. They come to work looking forward to it. They've got things that they're enthused about and you know, they're engaged. Um, about 50% are not particularly engaged. You know, they do the minimum. They show up for work. They do what they're told and so on, but they're I don't know if, if you got a, a boat, they're sightseeing, right? You got three guys that are pulling on the oars hard. You got five guys that are kind of sightseeing. Yeah, they'll do the odd thing here and there, but eh, yeah. And then you got two guys that are trying to sink your boat. They are actively disengaged. So the real question for, for management is how do you get more people engaged and at least stop the people who are actively disengaged, trying to sink your boat. How do you get them away from doing that? And, and that's, to me, you know, those kinds of numbers are incredibly compelling about we better do something. We might not know what it is, but that's not acceptable. Yeah. So, so my question might be, how do we do that? Well, I think that you, you like I said, you start small but you have lots of little bitty things going on. You might in one area, in one part of the, the operation, you, you pick a machine maybe, and you put together a cross-functional team, a couple of operations, senior operations folks, maybe a, you know, a greenhorn, so he learns or she learns, and a couple of maintenance folks, and maybe an engineer. And you say, this machine, I wanna make it right. Now, you tell me how we need to do that. And, and sometimes it's something as simple as cleaning it. Because when you clean it, you have to inspect it. As you inspect it, you detect all these defects. And now that you've detected the defects, you can correct it, make it right. And then you repeat that on another one and another one and another one. And you're never done. You're always putting together these small cross-functional teams each time with a little bit, you know, a different mix. So you get everybody exposed to this kind of, you know, uh, what culture. 
And after a while, things get to be pretty doggone good. And it doesn't have to be a machine. Maybe it's a procedure. Maybe it's your permitting procedure. Operations is always bitching about the permits. Maintenance is always bitching about the permits. And the planner is always bitching about the permits. Well, put your heads together and work it out. Yeah. You know, instead of bitching, work it out. So, you know, every, every company out there, even the best companies, they've got problems. But the best companies see those literally, and I know this sounds a bit, you know, whatever. Uh, literally, they have methods where they identify the problems and they work it out. Yeah. You're never going to be without problems, <laughs> even in the best companies. So, and so that goes back to the issue of leadership again, though. How is leadership going to create an environment where you have this structured improvement time where you apply cross functional teams to address, you know, the hundreds of little problems out there? And you've got to set the expectation, you've got to provide the time for folks to do it, you've got to give them a little money. And then you got to run with it. And when they do it, you say, wow, that's a great job. Thank you very much. You know, you have a pizza party or you have something, you know, where you recognize it. Not a big deal. And if you do that, you'll have more profit. If you do that, you can share it with all those folks that made it possible. Yeah. So it's, it's a virtuous system when you set it up like that. And it's also what? It's not so virtuous if you don't. Yeah, the so, reverse is what we don't want to see, and it's unfortunately what we all too often do see. So that yeah. that's really thanks for providing that insight on that, Ron. It's I can clearly see it from what you described there. You know how to create that cross-functional collaboration, start small and create the pilot, engage yeah. and support them to achieve, and then celebrate it simply at the at the end of it. But also the idea that potentially there is some avenue to do some some further down the track if there is a you know, some, um, you know, some even financial return that comes out of it down the track as you get better performance. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and just to be clear, that's not to ignore some major issue where you need to, you know, redesign a part of the plan because of new technology coming on. That's, you know, that still needs to be done. But what I'm saying is, you know, down at the, you know, the shop floor level, you need to have these, you know, these, uh, you know, routine, you know, this routine structured improvement, improvement time where you engage folks' minds and let them be creative, right, at the shop floor level in, in creating solutions for the, the problems that are out there. So, yeah. Ron, yeah. what have you seen work well for when those teams at the front line encounter things that they haven't got the authority or power to just implement? What have you seen to work well in an organization where they're, they're running an improvement on a machine? Maybe something bigger comes up that is an impediment to them moving forward. What, yeah. what have you seen well that supports that? Well, unless you have the right environment where they feel comfortable bringing those issues up, uh, not much. Okay. So if, if you don't create an environment where folks feel comfortable to bring up problems and where you respond to that by engaging them and helping resolve that problem, or you tell them, well, here's why that is. And here's why we can't do anything about it. Cause that will happen on occasion. But if you don't have that, you know, that sort of free and open communication, then I don't know, you might have a little success story here and there because one or one, another supervisor sees it, and fosters it and supports it but if you don't have that that that's going to be by happenstance not by design not not a systematic approach so i i don't know if there's a, a good answer to that other than the leadership of the organization has to create the culture that fosters that sort of thing so you know the executive leaders have to provide the resources and, and the overall strategy and vision, the sort of mid-level managers have to provide the time for people to do the work. And then the shop floor guys provide the ideas. 
Now, now all that gets done under some, you know, high level strategy goals, you know, that, you know, overarching approach to things so that people can relate what they're doing, how that supports that, that overarching approach to things. And if you have that, you're going to be far more successful. If you don't, well, I don't know that there's a solution. <laughs> yeah. <I laughs> maybe, maybe there is. I just don't know it. Yeah. You know, I've heard so it called, I, uh, I've heard it called permafrost or mud, you know, where there's not that support mechanism from leadership when impediments or issues come up that, that frontline cross functional team can't deal with and it gets yeah. lost or gets stuck in middle management mud. So, what right. you're saying, Ron, it comes back to leadership again leadership yeah. having those systems above those frontline cross functional teams that if an impediment yeah. or problem comes up, it can be aired in a trustful, supportive environment and yeah. it can get supported to either be overcome or or discussed why it can't be overcome and let's pick the next target. Yeah. But you, you got to put some sort of structure and I don't mean it's a, you know, a rigorous or detailed or exhaustive structure in place, but you got to put in place some sort of structure that fosters that, you know, and, you know, a couple of war stories here. Uh, I was at a refinery and the refinery manager, great guy. You know, and he was, he had bought into all these, all these things we've been talking about. And he had that, the, the management style to do that, except for, you know, maybe one little thing. He was real budget conscious. And so I was in his office one day, we were talking about, you know, things and the guy comes in and says, you know, gives him a quick brief on a project they're working on. And then he says, uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be another five grand that we didn't anticipate. And Ed was the guy's name. He said, can you take it out of your existing budget? And the guy said, well, I'll go look at it. And after the guy left, I said, Ed, you just screwed up, buddy. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, you put a damper, give him the $5,000. I mean, that's a fart in a tornado. In your <laughs> operation. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you dampen his enthusiasm by not authorizing another another five grand? And to his credit, he took it to heart and said, Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. It's just my nature. I've been conditioned and trained that way. So that's what I did. I said, You'll get that money back. Yeah. Yeah. By virtue of the work they're going to do for you. Yeah. So unless your budgets are really, really constrained, not to worry, yeah. you'll get it back. You got to trust your folks. If you don't trust them, you got, you got the wrong people in the wrong positions. Go to the enterprise excellence academy.com backslash downloads to get hold of a time optimization program that will be available for a limited period. This program has been designed to help the individual and leaders save time themselves that they can then put more to an excellence journey. It's connected with the Enterprise Excellence Academy release of Agile Training and Community. To get involved, go to the website enterpriseexcellenceacademy.com to connect, to learn more, or register. Let's get back to the episode. And that's yeah. that's your constraint then, so you need to deal with that constraint. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen site managers, they can't spend $25,000 without, they're, they're operating a $500 million or billion dollar operation. And they have to go to corporate for approval for twenty five thousand dollars. I mean, to me, that's just stupid. Yeah. And my wife cautioned me not to use that word, but I mean, yeah. that's just in the stupid bucket. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. If you can't trust a guy to spend twenty five thousand dollars effectively, you got the wrong guy in the position. So, anyways, that's... yeah, no, it's too true. <laughs> Especially in the scheme of things, it's it's just so small, isn't it? So small. But those yeah. simple things can shift culture, can't they? Again, that's a system that can either work for a culture or work against it, depending on how it runs. Yeah. Well, I, I used to, you know, back in the good old days when I was president of CSI, I used to give these, you know, corporate speeches, you know, where you bring people up to speed on the corporate finances and the new products and all the things that you're doing, you know, just to try to engage them and, and get some enthusiasm about the future of the business and, one of the things I used to say was, look, uh, you guys are closer to the problems than I am. You know, you see a problem, solve it. You know, if you make a mistake, I forgive you. 
What'd you learn? What can you do differently next time so that you'll do better? And I was trying to empower these guys, engage them. And, yeah. and I said, if you, if you make a big mistake, it's my fault for not putting the right systems in place, not giving you right training. Now, in truth, I would go back to my office and close the door and go, God, I hope that works. Because <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You're authorizing folks to do what they think is right. Well, it may not be right, yeah. but you hope it is. But what I found in, in taking that approach, nine times out of 10, it'll be right. Mm, and yeah. the 10th ten, the time that it's not quite right, they'll learn something. Yeah. And, and the odd, you know, one in a hundred times where they really you know, screw it up. It's okay. You got that back 10 times over with the other 99. Yeah. So, it's a lot, lot better than the opposite, isn't it? Where there's a more of a fear culture and they're just going to hide the thing, things that go wrong. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think it's far, far better. Yeah. But that's my style. Ron, really appreciate the knowledge, mate. It's been an amazing conversation around, you know, achieving greater operational reliability and performance and that factor on leadership, leadership, understanding the whole approach, aligning the organization mm -hmm. strategically, but also cross-functionally for the system yeah. and then engaging people. Ron, what be, for our listeners nowadays, we do a two minute tip, which is just like a two minute tip that you'd have of where to start or what a leader or team member should kick off with. What would be your two minute tip? Well, um, one's more strategic and then the other one's maybe more specific. One is to think of reliability. Like I just defined it earlier, <laughs> the ability of production process to produce maximum quality product on time in full at the lowest sustainable cost, you know, that, that'd be one. But the other one is, is just to pick something, pick a problem, put together a cross-functional team and work it out. And, and then just repeat, 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 repeat until it becomes part of your ethos, you know, part of your culture. But you got to you got to kind of think at a systems level about what reliability is about. And it's about design, buy, store, install, start up, operate, and maintain about all those functional elements working collectively to a common purpose and collaborating on the issues. So it's, it's that higher level thinking about what reliability is about and then engaging folks in just little things that they can do that are within their purview, within their control and, and, you know, turning them loose. I don't mean that literally, but encouraging, fostering, supporting their activities to solve those problems. So, you know, if, if you do that, I think you're going to get much, much better results. Yeah, that's neat, Ron. Thanks so much for that. Ron, what's been a recent insight or learning for you? Like what's been something you've, you've learned recently? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at my age, <laughs> not much, I suppose, but, <laughs> but I will tell you one, uh, one little thing that I was struck by, and it hasn't been this year, but it was, I don't know, last year, I think, was there was a guy named Waddington. And I don't know if you've heard that name before, but he was a Brit and he was uh, looking at B-24 bomber reliability. Now, this is in World War II. Oh, wow. So this is 80 years ago. <laughs> and, and he had this chart and he noticed that after every time they would do, you know, every 50 hours, they were obligated to do. A, uh, a a maintenance a major maintenance activity you know like a shutdown turnaround an overhaul right and shortly after that the number of repairs for every 10 flight hours just spiked right after the maintenance thing right and then over the next 50 hours it would go down to near nothing and then they would do another major maintenance and the you know the repairs would spike again and down and spike so you know we've known now for 80 years <laughs> that time-based intrusive maintenance is probably not a good idea unless you've got data to substantiate doing that 
and that having something that's condition based is probably a better approach. Yeah. And designing out the defects so you don't even have to detect them is an even better idea. So, you know, we've known that now. And I didn't I didn't know that Waddington stumbled across this back in World War II looking yeah. at maintenance records for B-24 bombers. So that's a, you know, that was remarkable to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and here we are, here we are 80 years later, and some people are still insisting on ripping stuff apart mm. when they don't need to. Yeah, big major overhaul type work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah without evidence to, you know, support that. So, yeah. You Anyways. just take that, you take that thing and you shake it up and then you put it back together and invariably, you know, <laughs> what's the chances that something isn't going to go wrong? Well, if it's complex, it's almost certain. You know, if yeah. it's a complex system, it's almost certain you're going to mess something up. Yeah. You know, because there's just too many moving parts and too many people involved and, you know, too many things that can go wrong. Yeah, some of them will. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's great insight. Ron, I, I gained a lot of insight from that. Ron, yeah. how, how can people reach out to you if they want Ron to learn more or to connect in and get your book? Well, the books on Amazon, all my books are. So, you know, that, uh, and I, I will be in Australia at the end of March of next year, COVID willing. Yeah. <laughs> Cause if I have to quarantine for two weeks, I'm not coming. I can imagine. So, but right now, uh, and I'm fully vaccinated and I'll get my booster here in the next month or so, but planning on uh, coming to Australia through surf round tables, uh, somewhere the end of March, you know, they've got the details and I'll be, I think first stop is Brisbane, then out to Perth, then back to Melbourne, then up to Sydney. That's over a big a, trip. That's a big trip. Oh yeah. Well, that's, that's typical. You know, when I come to see you guys, I don't, I only spend a couple of days in one spot, you know, and then I'm off on the next, to, to the next site. So, uh, but if, if they can contact, you know, surf round tables, you know, they just Google them. I'm sure they're out there. If they want to reach me personally, uh, my email is R O N S R M G P at AOL.com. That's Romeo Oscar Nike Sierra Romeo Mike Golf Papa at AOL.com. Or you can text me, you know, plus one, eight six five two oh seven five seven nine eight. So you can call me too, but if you call me in the middle of the night, I'm gonna be upset. <laughs> I bet, Ron. I bet. Oh. Watch that listens in Australia. Just note that. We're opposite right. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ron, yeah. mate, I really appreciate the knowledge and the insights and all you've done and continue to do to help us create a better future. Mate, really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I love coming to Australia. You know, I think you've got a wonderful country. And yeah. If I ever get kicked out of the U.S., I'll come knocking on your door first. <laughs> Please. would welcome. Like, I've, I've gained. It would be wonderful to have you. And I'll, I'll be seeing you in Brisbane when you're out, Ron. So looking forward to it. Thanks, mate. All right. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Take care. Bye, folks. Go get them. Go do what we've been talking about. <laughs> Too true. What a great episode with Ron Moore. The key takeaways for me from this episode were, one, align as a leader working to create alignment of the organization strategically to a common purpose, vision, and goals, helping cross-functional teams align systematically to work together and to improve the ultimate purpose and goal and create flow and value for customers. The second key takeaway for me was leadership, leadership, leadership. We hear the importance of leadership through so many studies, books and experts. Why? Because leadership ultimately does or does not apply the energy to create strategic and cross-functional alignment. Leadership will either take an approach that engages or disengages people as they deploy the strategy and changes required. Ron's advice to start small and then support these small cross-functional teams to overcome challenges and recognize wins was amazing. Also, Ron's discussion around leadership behaviors, such as the budget example, was so important. How, as a leader, 
can you reflect on your behaviours and the systems that you have in place in your organisation, learn from it regularly and adapt? How can you do this continuously and improve into the future? I recommend considering the retrospective approach out of Agile. Each day, week or month, reflect and write down what you should keep doing, stop doing and start doing moving forward to help your organisation achieve greater operational reliability and performance. Think heavily on the systems you have in place and what behaviours these drive in your people and your own behaviours as a leader. Well, that's the end of this episode with Ron. To quote Ron here, how do we help you solve your problems to be more successful? That's also what we're trying to do with the Enterprise Excellence Academy and community that Em and I have set up in the Asia Pacific region, kicking off as of April 2022. We want to help solve your problems through training and most importantly, a community. The community is key to keeping regular communication around what we're trying to achieve. It connects you with our world's experts going forward each month, but also allows us to help each other and keep each other on the path, overcoming challenges and achieving great things. Thanks again, Ron. I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye for now.